Reply from the Mandalay Bay Convention Center in Las Vegas. It's the Q covering VMworld 2016. Brought to you by VMware and its ecosystem sponsors. Now, here are your hosts, John Furrier and Stu Miniman. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Day three of VMworld. We're here live in Las Vegas. This is theCUBE, SiliconANGLE Media's flagship program. We go out to the events and extract the signal from the noise. I'm John Furrier. Day three, coverage of wall-to-wall, -wall, three days of coverage at the hang space at the Mandalay Bay Convention Center. We're here at the SiliconANGLE Media team, research team from Wikibon, Stu Miniman, also my co-host, Peter Burris co-hosting on the director's set, and David Floyer, CTO uh, at, at Wikibon. Uh, who's been scouring the landscape, sitting in briefings. Peter's been doing 50-50 briefings and, and hosting. Stu's been hosting all day. Of course, uh, we've, been, we've been banging out the coverage all, all three days. And so let's get into it, guys. Analyst uh, uh, session here. I want to get the analyst take. Today's customer day on theCUBE. We have a lot of customers on talking about how they're using uh, the technologies as VMware morphs into a broader, bigger company from a one product virtualization to a multitude of products and technologies, all trying to solve the complexity, as they say. That's in their DNA, as, as, as uh, the VMware execs say. David, um, make sense of this. <laughs> Are they doing a good job? Is the engine of innovation for VMware functioning? What's under the hood? Is it working? What's your thoughts? Okay, <laughs> well, that's a broad range of questions. So, so is it working? Like, so, is it working? Yes. Uh, I thought this was the best VMware that uh, VMworld that I've been to. Uh, it was it's much more confident of their role within the data center and within the service provider. Much much more uh, uh, engaging, much more uh, partnership orientated, and I, I thought that uh, the start of it was the the, the gr great confidence they had in Michael Dell. Um, he seems to be able, he seems to be signaling that he's going to allow them all the latitude they need in the world to make partnerships within the Dell enterprise and also outside of it. I thought that confidence really came through uh, as opposed to the handle on the throat that EMC often appeared to have. So that's a good thing and I think it showed. You say EMC kind of had this invisible hand, the federation, yes, you know, right. kind of backdooring yeah. into yeah. access. Yeah. And you're saying you, you feel good at, about the sincerity of Michael Dell. That's right, if you look at vSAN, for example, vSAN, six years, it should have been out three years ago uh, in volume. And you felt that EMC was holding things back. Uh, maybe for good business reasons, but holding things back. But we've just done our uh, service and report on uh, on the the the, the uh, vSAN itself and uh, Nutanix and all the other players in this space. And vSAN have grown very aggressively. Um, the quality of the product, the the customers are really liking it, and uh, they look ready to go. And, and obviously, following on from server virtualization comes the storage virtualization. Well, I want to just, for the folks watching, just say that uh, he mentioned the server SAN report from Wikibon. Wikibon had put out the early definitive server SAN statement, which by the way, wasn't really getting a lot of cheers. In some cases, a lot of people were like, yes, this is right. A lot of people didn't agree with it. But now, it was highlighted on stage. It's on wikibon.com. Go look for the server SAN report. It's been updated. It's going viral. So in the show here, that report, congratulations, guys, is going viral. It's what everyone's talking about. And the vSAN success, I was talking to Parak Patel uh, yesterday in the hallway. He's you know, driving, it's exploding. So, so why is that going viral? Can you share just some color guys, Stu and oh. David? What, why is the, the server SAN report that you guys did, why was it so groundbreaking? Why is it going viral here at the show? Yeah, so, so just to give a little bit of context here, when I joined Wikibon six years ago, uh, David gave me a re-education on some of IT. I'd spent lots of years in enterprise IT, hardened everything, you know, really so much focus on hardware, and uh, the, the joke we always have is hardware eventually fails, software eventually works. The <laughs> software guys um, have a very different architecture. We understand that every component's going to fail, and we talk about hyperscale architectures, and when we first started seeing these early 
companies that were building what we now call hyperconverge were like, wait, hyperscale meets enterprise. We were connecting the dots. When we put out that thesis in the marketplace, they're like, this is really interesting, uh, but your forecast, we don't believe this at all. And every year, the last three years, they say, your data this year looks really good and we believe everything you said, but uh, your next year stuff. And after three years of putting this out now, they're like, wait, we keep agreeing with you every year and we're going there. Maybe you guys really have something here. So, I mean, David, c congratulations. It's been a pleasure to work with you on this stuff. The feedback at this show, not just from VMware, but all the other players in the market and the surrounding has been, you know, really vindicating after, you know, the hard work we've been putting So in. why is it going viral then? And what's the question? So guys, explain, why is it going viral? Things just don't go viral because, you know, the, no, well, good, the track record is obviously there, yeah. too. I agree, but why is it going viral? Everyone's so, talking about this one report. Right. The, f fundamentally, the thesis is that storage is going from the SAN itself closer to the server. And if you combine the two together, you get a, a much, much better uh, performance from the two. And it's also combined with flash. There's a lot more flash now, and the, the flash is taking away that uh, ability to have things at distance. It's got to be close to the server. And what's happening within the server as a whole is now the network is the bottleneck. And now you're seeing the combination of much faster networks, people like Mellanox, for example, much faster storage with the flash and, uh, attached, and the processors themselves, the three together, are making a much lower cost, higher performance. And if you look at people like Datacore, which are a, a small company, they've got benchmarks using this methodology, which are now five million IOPS, uh, absolutely out of this world, twice as fast as any of the original SAN. And because vendors. of the configuration? Or is it all closer together? So, so another yeah. way of putting it is that it used to be that the latency off the disk and the subsystems associated with the disk was large enough that slow networks or slower networks didn't get in the way. Now with flash, the latency out of flash is so low that you have to worry about the speed of light. David's right, it's pushing it back closer to the server without reducing the software interfaces and manageability. So it's not direct attach, but instead it's using software but pushing it slower so you can operate at faster speeds. And obviously the application pressure too for real-time data, having stuff processed faster, is that also contributing to this new kind of um, way of doing things? Yeah, it's a whole number of technologies. Um, you've got erasure coding in there. People, um, people like Pivot3 who have used erasure coding for years uh, being the basis of this, and again, lowering the cost. So it's a continual uh, application of a lot of different technologies, and innovation that's happening in this area is mind-blowing. It's just fantastic. Yeah, so David, it reminds me a lot of what you're working on now is some of those same considerations of you know, storage and networking and latency if factor into IoT and edge computing and everything else. I know that's something you've yeah. been looking at at this show. Maybe you can give our audience an update as to that. Yeah, there's, um, edge is a funny word. Edge from an IT perspective is round the edge. You know, it's the, it's the factories, it's the, uh, the, those funny people out there on the edge and headquarters is the center. Uh, from an IoT perspective, the edge is actually where the real value is being created, whether it's you know, a, a, a nuclear power station or a factory or whatever it is. They take a different view of the world. And uh, there's a view that every, if within a lot of people in IT that this is the edge and we should have the data and put it all in the center. From an IoT perspective, they want to be, maximize the value that they get out of the data in, in real time, maximize that, and hold that data probably much closer to the edge, and then if people want it, come and get it uh, from them. And they will be doing a lot of the analytics out there on the edge. So it's a different view of the world. Um, we think that the edge is going to be an area of innovation uh, within IT where uh, the, it's got to be highly available, highly uh, changeable from the outside, managed from the outside, but the edge is going to be an area where there's innovation, people putting out very, very large amounts of storage, et cetera, very close to the action itself. So, Stu, we can update what you said. Hardware fails, software... Uh, hardware eventually fails, software eventually works. <laughs> hardware eventually fails, software eventually wins, physics doesn't care. 
<laughs> um, and we're doing uh, we're doing a significant new piece of market research exactly on what David's talking about. So take a look at that. Anybody that wants to contribute, Peter at SiliconANGLE, that's the direction we're taking. So the one quick comment that I would make is that uh, I've never been to a VMware or VMworld before, uh, but I've heard a lot about the challenges and tensions, many of which that David mentioned. One of the things that I see coming out of this, and it's going to be interesting to hear what the customers have to say, is the degree to which VMware becomes a salve, a glue, a way of bringing together the, D and e, the Dell and EMC ecosystems and, uh, and, and helps use software to unify the whole thing. That's a great point, and I think one of the things that, that, that David said also sparks that conversation. I has, I've been, all show, I've been asking always have these little questions, the puzzle pieces I'm trying to figure out. And one of them is the future of the ecosystem. And really, what does VMware stand for? And so I've been kind of asking all the execs these kind of pointed questions, but one of them I'll share. And, and I asked um, Gelsing in this and I, and I asked some of the other ones, um, what's VMware trying to do? And actually, the best answer came from Steve Herod, who's no longer with VMware, but he's, he was the CTO now at, uh, as a VC. He said, VMware's DNA is to solve complexity and make things simple. That was their original DNA of virtualization. And so what's interesting is, I asked him, so what are they tackling now? What is the complexity that, that they're tackling? And how is that rendering itself in the customer environment? So the next series of questions goes to the customer. What's the complexity, the complexity that you are trying to solve. abstract away yeah. right. to enable faster acceleration of innovation? And that's storage on the one hand and network on the other. I, I would add one more to that, uh, and that is we are going to enter into a period of uncertainty about inter-cloud communication. That uh, there's going, we're going to see a pretty significant amount of money being spent on how do we ensure that clouds can work together. Yeah. We saw some good data from uh, VMware. It's actually a little bit less than I had thought, but the average shop, the average CIO is administering at least two to three relationships with cloud suppliers. Nothing wrong with that. They need, alternate, they need alternative sources, but how you arbitrate the services out of those clouds so that you end up with more simplification is going to be crucial. That's an interesting point, and I want to get you guys to comment on, on a, a point a v, at the VC party last night, Lightspeed Ventures, all the VCs from Silicon Valley were there, and I, they were asking me, what's the hot startup here? And I was scratching my head going, you know, there's not a lot of big movement, but then I said, well, here's the areas that I think are going to be interesting, and, and the interclouding was interesting, and, and they, what, what is that, what's interclouding? Well, we kind of were riffing on that term with Lou Tucker on theCUBE a couple years ago, but it, it was what internetworking did during that explosion of TCP IP, birth Cisco 3Com, so exactly this is right, a new John. area, so how does internetworking, if you use the analog, to interclouding, is it the software, is it the IOT? I'm going to let David the, answer the question yeah. and get to the, but, but it's, it's, it's not unlike the experience that the industry went through when we went from mini computer to client server. Fundamentally, it wasn't Intel and the PC that killed digital and DG and those companies, it was TCP IP killed their proprietary networks. Yeah. The industry decided it was not going to bridge these networks, it was going to flatten them. And a similar type of thing is likely to happen in, in certain respects in some of this intercloud communication. But it all comes back to what David was talking about earlier. How do you handle storage? How do you handle network? How do you handle the CPU? TCP IP was things. open. That's okay, right. at birth, yeah. Cisco, basically, yeah. and 3Com. It's TCP and fast Ethernet, man. So that really, what's open now, that's the similar disruptive enabler yeah. that could create the kind of innovation and wealth that that, that, that is the big opportunity. To me, that's the big opportunity. Totally. Uh, at can, least in infrastructure. Can, uh, in infrastructure. Can VMware get into there? When you look in more detail, you see that NSX is actually required for this inter cloud communication. Are Azure and AWS going to allow that? Uh, yeah. I, I think there's an opportunity. Well, I asked Matt Gelsing that yeah. point. I'm like, how are you going to enter cloud with uh, yeah. Amazon? Oh, they have APIs. I'm like, uh -huh. you're going to sling APIs? <laughs> that's your answer? Come on, Pat. Come on, go deeper than that. Well, but they, the, I mean, it's that internet, interconnective tissue from the networking side. So, you yeah, know, I it, think there's it, another there's a little bit of relationship well. there, just like yeah. Amazon with VPCs kind of reaching. That networking yeah. is, is going to be where we build some of those bridges and tunnels. I, I, uh, I think there's between. another answer that may come out, which would be equally important, and that is physical location. So if you have co-location with, for example, Equinix in that space, and you have all of the other cloud vendors in that same physical space, the people who are going to own that intercommunication 
are the people running that data so center. The facility will matter. So the facility oh, very much so. uh, mechanisms for Physics allowing matters. that. Yeah. Physics, Physics matters. matters. Right, but but yeah. ju just one thing. But when okay. VMware bought NYSERA, NYSERA can actually bridge between various hypervisors, and that's what they're doing. So let's not confuse physical networking with the virtual networking, which is really where VMware sits. But we got to be careful so. about bridge-based solutions. Right. Uh, yeah. No, no uh, question. Well, yeah, the so, tunneling, so, we've been talking for decades about so this. So everything we're talking about just proves that this is going to become a problem because we're trying to do we're trying to make a lot of these systems they're working but performing some at, unnatural acts and as a consequence over the course of the next few years this is going to David's right this is going to be where it all happens right, so what's the complexity that being needs to be solved that's the question the complexity is how do you get different cloud systems to communicate with each other at the data level. Of so the that you don't have level. to segment your applications and your data. Exactly. Yeah, and, yeah. And, and I mean, step one is really, we're going to manage multiple pieces there because yeah. oh, right. moving is, you know, a moving whole different data thing. is, and, is and for the birds. I, I think I've yeah. heard many times today, yeah. it, it's more of just kind of the interconnecting tissue, not, you know, global V-motion is, you know, maybe hyped a little bit too much over the years. Yes. But I don't really, know that you know, we're going to get, well, let's put it this way. We're not going to get a stateless TCP IP to solve the problem <laughs> because what we're talking about involves a lot of state. So at the end of the day, this is going to be an area of a lot of innovation, a lot of invention, a lot of innovation. Uh, VMware is going to be in the mix, and I think that that's what we want to talk to customers about. How is VMware going to be in the mix of solving these problems? And the whole question of what open means, it's just because you use open source doesn't mean that you are open. There are new lock-in mechanisms evolving that don't <laughs> require any proprietary code, but could have some nice sticky factors like data. So it's going to be very interesting next couple of years, guys. I mean, it's, it's Microsoft's got the, the big yeah. move to make right now. I mean, don't yep. you think? I mean, Absolutely. what they do now is would be very telling. What Microsoft does with Azure Cloud is going to be it's, really, really telling. Yep, 100%. Yep. Okay, guys, analysts, breaking it down right there. They're breaking down the opportunities for creation of innovation and wealth and jobs in, in, the, in this area for startups and the big companies also the, where VMware could go. This is theCUBE, breaking it down. We're going to hear from customers today, day three. I'm John Furrier with Stu Miniman, Peter Burris, and David Floyer here on theCUBE. We'll be right back with more. You're watching theCUBE.